The Alabama Farmers Federation and the Alabama Farmers Cooperative proudly present Simply Southern with your hosts, Jim Allen and Mary Johns. Hello and thanks for joining us for Simply Southern. I'm Mary Johns. And I'm Jim Allen. On today's show, Kevin Worthington reports from New Orleans where the American Farm Bureau Federation is celebrating 100 years of service to U.S. farmers and consumers. For 100 years, this organization has faithfully represented the men and women who are the backbone of our country. It's an imposing, powerful piece of art created from a pile of pumpkins. And it's just one of the many unique seasonal attractions you can find on a walk through the Huntsville Botanical Garden. It's really something, something to see because, you know, there's just not that many three-dimensional pumpkins displays like this. After you've harvested your garden, how can you make your vegetables last longer? Sydney Phelps of Bonnie Plants says dehydrating and freezing will do the trick. But up next, we'll hook up with some crafty conductors who keep the trains running on time from a garage. What sustains us? Food, family, faith. Alabama farmers live those things every day. They conserve our resources, clothe our families, and fill our tables. They cultivate jobs for our communities and values for our future. Farmers grow it all right here in Alabama. There's no such thing as downtime when you own a farm. This is your land. You tend it and try to get the most from it, no matter the weather or time of day. It's been that way for generations. And for generations, your local quality co-op store has been there for you, with a full range of agriculture supplies and services, from feed to fertilizer, seed to grain storage, and the right hardware for any application. You'll always find what you need, plus friendly, knowledgeable advice at your local quality co-op store. There's one near you. There was a time that every boy's daydreams included a little model train chugging away under the tree on Christmas morning. Today's children may be more interested in Facebook likes and locomotives, but there's something about running the rails that still charms people of all ages. There's a whole world of activity going on in Brett Scott's garage. The traffic usually isn't bad. Folks go to work, do a little grocery shopping on the way home, and maybe take the family to a drive-in when the weekend rolls around. If you're more of an outdoorsy sort, there are plenty of trails to hike and mountains to climb. And there's trains, lots and lots of trains. Welcome to the layout of Prattville's MGB Model Railroad Club, an indoor engineer's oasis. A layout is a recreation of either a real place in the world or a recreation of something that's in your mind that you want to uh, build. Our layout here is what we call freelance, so it's just pretty much what we wanted to build. It didn't really represent anything in the actual world. Brett and some of his train-loving friends started the club in 1995. After moving to their current location in 2004, they began applying their collective modeling expertise toward building a miniature universe for their railroad. Although some of the pieces decorating the layout are ordered, there's a lot of work that goes into bringing this world to life. Some places you'll see where we've painted the foam so it looks like earth and we'll put grass on it. Other places we'll put in casted rocks or uh, plaster of Paris to build scenery. Uh, our trees are mostly all handmade from Nandina bush and crushed up foam that's been dyed. We have a mountain that has a Indian head on it, kind of like uh, Mount Rushmore might be. We have hidden in the woods a moonshine still that people in Alabama might be familiar with. Just in the details, got to really look for them. We don't always point them out to visitors because part of the fun is seeing all the details for yourself. And then there's the trains, folks. If you think all the details in the scenery with these guys, wait until they put on their engineer hat. We don't just run trains around in a circle like some people, but we like to uh, set up schedules and we have uh, manifests, we call them, where we switch the trains and, and we uh, service the different industries that are on our railroad. And that's a typical day here at uh, MGB, it's, uh, just like a real railroad. An operating session at MGB probably isn't too different than what you'd see with a real railroad. 
A central dispatch office communicates with operators to make sure rail traffic runs smoothly. The trains come gradually up to speed, mimicking their real-world counterparts. And if all that isn't realistic enough for you, recorded sounds are pumped in for dramatic effect. I've even suggested we have some of the smells. Uh, I think some of my, my fellow club members kind of drew the line at that when I started talking about cow stockyards and such. Maybe that's a little bit too far. <laughs> with video games and smartphone apps occupying younger minds, you'd think playing with electric trains would be strictly for us old guys. But Brett says kids love visiting their layout and running trains too. Some even stick around. I was kind of getting more interested in it heard about this place, came here, and guys were super nice, welcomed me in, and haven't been able to get rid of me since. <laughs> I've brought a few of my friends out, even ones, ones that aren't interested in trains necessarily. They just seen some of the, I post like some of the cars that I weather on Facebook and stuff, and they see that, and, and they really enjoyed it. I have a theory that my, my friends laugh about. I, I say there's a railroad gene, and that some people get it, and some people don't. Um, I, I just was kind of born loving trains, and I've, I've seen that in others uh, that have become members of our club. It's just something in you that you just love trains, and it, and that it's anything from the model to the real thing. It's just something that's in you that you're just passionate about. Man, I wish you'd been there to see this place. I've heard of a man cave, but never a man depot. And there's a lounge next door to the layout where the fellows like to take pizza breaks and watch football. I don't know too much about trains, but I'm thinking about signing up. Well, I wouldn't blame you, but I hope they have a model insurance office somewhere on that layout, because if you're doing all that switching, connecting, and everything else, they might have a model emergency on their hands with you at the wheel. Well, you know I have driven a real train on the show before. That's a good point. No catastrophes there. Now, when Simply Southern continues, find out what it takes to turn a heap of more than 1,000 pumpkins into a fanciful masterpiece fit for a fairy tale. Soybean is a very versatile product. We make crayons out of it. A lot of the combines you see rolling through the fields have a lot of plastic side panels that are made from a soy product. The soybeans that we grow on our farm mostly goes into chicken feed. Soybean production in Alabama employs over 10,000 people. We grow some of the best soybeans in the world. We go the extra mile to make sure when our name is stamped on it, we know it's the best product we can produce. You could see it before anyone else. Your future. Your own place. Independence. It's not perfect, but you love it. A place to grow. To be yourself. All for a better life. Dream big. Alpha Insurance. For a life. Protect your dream with Alpha's new business owner policies. A farmer has to live on faith. We do all we can do, but we can only control so much. Alabama is the second largest poultry growing state in the nation, so we're trying our best to grow all the corn we can for that. What we produce not only feeds and clothes all of the United States, but about half of what we make goes onto the world market. We've been able to improve yields, have some things that, that can help us produce a better crop. I'm proud of the product we make and proud that I can say I'm an Alabama farmer. Pumpkins are a popular festive fall decoration, whether craftily carved or left intact and stacked. They were also just the right thing for a monstrous sculpture in the mythical and magical displays at Huntsville Botanical Gardens last October. While a wizard could wave a magic wand to make all those pumpkins appear, in Alabama, it takes an experienced farmer to produce perfect pumpkins worthy of a masterpiece. Lurking behind the mums at a bend in the sidewalk stands an unexpected and frightful sight, a dragon guarding his treasure of golden pumpkins. But upon closer inspection, this dragon must be a distant cousin of Elliot or Falcor, as his friendly face is unlikely to unleash a torrent of fire. The dragon, we'll call him Jack, was the brainchild of Garden Director of Horticulture Nikki Southers and volunteer Steve Kinnamer. 
We're always challenging ourselves on what we can do to bring more people here to the garden. And our Scarecrow Trail has been our, a big feature for the fall, but it's kind of like, what else can you do to add to Scarecrow Trail? And so pumpkins are what you want to do to add to Scarecrow Trail. So it kind of started out as an exhibit on the ground and grew into a 3D exhibit that now we feel like we are, we're compelled to do annually. Last year we did the watering can and that turned out really nice. And we had this dragon frame from a previous uh, display that we did out of hay, hay bale art. And so I said, we can do that. I just need to strengthen it up to hold the weight of the pumpkin. So that's what we did. As you'd expect, forging a dragon from pumpkins and wire takes a good amount of planning and strategizing. If you've got a small diameter like the neck or the legs, you've got to use the smaller pumpkins. And then when you go like the underbelly or some of, some of the other areas, you can go to a larger pumpkin. With the need for so many different sizes, the garden staff had to figure out where to find that many pumpkins in a state that isn't the most conducive to growing gourds. We tried several years to grow pumpkins and we just couldn't get what we wanted and do what we wanted and so I contacted a friend of mine and I said, hey, I need somebody to grow pumpkins. And that's where Coleman County farmer Jeremy Calvert comes in. It's just a, a really challenging crop to grow in Alabama. Our summers are too hot. Our falls doesn't, don't, don't last long enough and are not cool enough quick enough, so it, it presents a lot of challenges. But even with those challenges, Jeremy's 15-acre pumpkin patch is sincere enough to make Linus jealous. From the traditional orange jack-o'-lantern pumpkins to green and white pumpkins that might plaster the cover of a Southern Living magazine, Jeremy grows over 30 varieties of fall's favorite gourd. They sell most of the pumpkins to the public at their farm store in Dodge City but a bunch of their pumpkins are destined to be decorations at the Huntsville Botanical Garden. While most folks pick out their perfect pumpkin in October, the garden staff have to know what they want before Jeremy starts planting. I began sending Nikki seed catalogs in January. She really puts her order in, you know, six, eight months ahead of time so that I have time enough to get the seed and, and get everything she wants planted. What's been great is, you know, just like I do with all the rest of my annuals, I get to select what I want instead of just picking out what's on the shelf already. So we make sure that we're in contact early in the year and we get to pick out on, through the catalogs, um, you know, which pumpkins and how many we want and he grows those specifically for us and then we're able to actually create a display. While the dragon takes up a bulk of the garden's pumpkin order, there are enough left over for beautiful displays all around the new event center. The garden is open year-round with numerous special events, including the annual Galaxy of Lights display at Christmas time and the Chinese Lantern Festival, which is March through May of this year. But the annual pumpkin sculptures have become a unique draw to the garden that also creates a special link to agriculture. We know that every person that comes to the garden is not interested in flowers, so it's getting people outside is still great and we want them to see the garden. So if they come to see the dragon and they get to see a little bit of the garden and they enjoy it at the same time, then that's even better. People have to realize that, hey, somebody actually had to grow this. Somebody actually had to plant a seed, take care of the plant, uh, take years in the planting to have, to have land to be able to grow this crop. I would like to think people have more of an awareness of agriculture because of it. 2018 was the third year the Huntsville Botanical Gardens worked with Jeremy Calvert and Calvert Farms for its unique pumpkin displays. The gardens are open year-round with special seasonal events. It also has an event center, gift shop, and a cafe called Table in the Garden. You can keep up with all the events online by visiting hsvbg.org. Coming up next, 100 years and going strong. We'll take you to the centennial celebration for America's largest farm organization when Simply Southern continues. One out of four Alabama residents have benefited from the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Last year, Master Gardener Managed Gardens donated $150,000 worth of fruits and vegetables to food banks and over 25,000 young people developed math, science, technology, and engineering skills through 4-H. Now what we want to know is, how can we help you? The versatile peanut. Meat of the earth. Friend of the soil. Tasty. Nutritious, packed with protein. And Alabama peanut farmers nourish some very special things. Families, communities, and 
and Alabama's economy. Peanuts. Good for you. Good for Alabama. And now, an Alabama tourism spotlight from Sweet Home, Alabama. Your visit to Monroeville, Alabama should begin on the Courthouse Square with a tour of the historic Old Courthouse Museum. Through photos and exhibits, you will discover personal stories of Truman Capote, famed actor and author of In Cold Blood and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Capote spent much of his childhood in Monroeville and became good friends with neighbor and future author Harper Lee. Lee wrote Pulitzer Prize winning novel To Kill a Mockingbird, a story loosely based on Lee's observations of her family, neighbors, and events that occurred near her hometown in Monroeville. If you visit between mid-April and mid-May, you may be able to see the play, based on Lee's novel, that is performed in the courthouse. For your next adventure, go online to alabama.travel. We've been raising fish for 33 years. Our farm and the catfish farms in Hale County, in this area, have had a huge impact on the labor, offering jobs. It's been a big economic boom for West Alabama. Our family is fully invested in U.S. farm-raised catfish. It was the end of World War I, and like the rest of the world, the U.S. economy was in recession. In an effort to make farming more profitable and communities a better place to live, farmers founded the American Farm Bureau Federation in Chicago in 1919. This year marks the organization's 100th anniversary, and our Kevin Worthington was in New Orleans for the celebration. Since 1919, the American Farm Bureau has represented agriculture in the halls of our nation's capital. A century after being established, many of the leaders in the federal government joined the organization and celebrate. For 100 years, this organization has faithfully represented the men and women who are the backbone of our country. We have many organizations that will come on board and be of help to us, or for that matter, uh, in opposition on what's being considered. Many times people will come up and just say, where's the Farm Bureau on this? That really speaks entirely to the subject that, uh, that we're talking about. So thanks to the Farm Bureau, thanks for the privilege of being here for the 100th anniversary. The first president was James Howard, and he said in 1920 that whatever's good for agriculture is good for the American people. And, uh, and I think we've proven that over and over and over again. Duval is just the 12th person to serve as AFBF president. He says he believes an America that didn't have the American Farm Bureau fighting for farmers would look vastly different than the one we know today. We would be buying our food from another country and we would be dependent on them delivering that food to us, which make, would make us a country that would not be secure. American agriculture provides a necessity, really more than one necessity. We have to eat as a people. And if we can't produce it, we will, we will depend on somebody else. And we have seen the evidence of what being dependent on our energy from another part of the country does to us. More than 100 Alabama farmers joined growers from the other 49 states and Puerto Rico at the convention. Many of them say they wouldn't be farming today without the voice of agriculture that Farm Bureau provides. As a farmer, we only represent 2% of the population and being just one farmer of that 2%, you know, we're by ourselves, we don't have a big voice, but when, when we're all together and when we have, we have an organization like AFBF, you know, it really gives us a, a good platform to stand on and it helps give, up, give us a voice, you know, on the national level. While marking this occasion with their counterparts from across the country, Alabama farmers are planning for their own celebration in less than two years. Uh, Alabama Farmers Federation was founded to be a politically active organization. I think folks that uh, analyze where we are today would say we've been successful at that. Uh, we've made a difference in our state. We've made a difference in agriculture in our state. We've made a big difference in rural 
Alabama. And uh, I'm excited about our celebrating the 100th anniversary. While it was founded to improve life in rural areas, Parnell says people from all walks of life have benefited from Alabama Farmers Federation's work over the past century. We were founded by farmers in order to uh, represent them politically. Then a few years later, we started an insurance company to sell insurance to our farmers. Over the years, we've evolved to where we sell insurance to the whole population of the state, and uh, we recruit the whole state to be members of our organization, and I uh, think we've been successful at representing those individuals in, in a way that a lot of them don't even realize that we represent them and represent their values and interest in state government. In New Orleans, I'm Kevin Worthington for Simply Southern. What one thing can you say about your local quality co-op store? You can trust us. You get what you need for your farm, for your lawn and garden, and the safest products for your pets. We're locally owned and operated, and you can trust that we care about our community and the people in it. So if you're a raised bed gardener, a rose gardener, or if you farm hundreds of acres, the Quality Co-op Store has exactly what you need to get the job done. All this plus friendly, knowledgeable advice. Your Quality Co-op Store. There's one near you. What we eat. What we wear. It all starts somewhere. And if it's good, it usually starts with a farmer. And that somewhere is right here in Alabama. In a field, in a barn, on a tractor. Right now, there's a farmer starting something good for all of us. And it all starts right here in Alabama. For more Simply Southern, be sure to follow us on social media. And while you're online, visit our website, simplysoutherntv.net. Simply Southern will continue in a moment. We believe a plant should be more than a plant. This one is, it's all you need for your garden to succeed because it's a bonnie plant. It represents hundreds of varieties of Bonnie's quality veggies and herbs. But more, it's from generations of Bonnie people who are passionate about sharing their love of gardening with you. Look for this little Bonnie plant and a whole family of plants like it in your garden center, Bonnie Plants, so you'll know how to grow. Hey folks, Sydney Phelps here with Bonnie Plants. Today we are talking about how to preserve your harvest, whether it be drying, whether it be freezing, these are all different methods that you can use to harvest that fresh garden and keep it for throughout the fall, throughout the winter, all the way back into time to start harvesting again in spring and summer. So we got a couple of different ways that we can talk about this today. So first off, let's talk about different methods of doing dehydration or freezing. Freezing is probably the simplest one. You, you're going to harvest your plants, you're going to blanch them. Uh, blanching is just basically a, a solution of citric acid uh, as well as some water. You want to get them in a hot. Uh, clean them off really good, hot water, blanch them in cold water, and then you can put it right into uh, your freezer to, to store for freezing. Uh, same thing with herbs, you can do different drying methods and we're going to talk about that. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the sun-dried tomatoes, you think about sun-dried tomato chips, uh, as well as different pasta sauces that you can see in the convenience store, that basically if you're dealing with a good summer day, uh, you want to take some kind of cheesecloth, lay out your tomatoes, slice them thinly, put them on a tray and, and set them outside uh, and let them just basically bake in the sunlight. But you wanna use the cheesecloth on top and bottom, that way you can get air through there but no critters uh, can, can cause you any problems. The other methods that you can look at using traditionally for air drying, uh, especially with herbs, when you're dealing with herbs, you wanna hang them in a warm, dry place that's dark so they can build up if you've got like a cellar uh, if you have uh, you know, a closet in your house, somewhere that has plenty of airflow that's going to be warm airflow that can work through that. When you're dealing with herbs, it's pretty simple. We've got some rosemary here that's freshly picked. You're just going to take uh, the cuttings, bunch them together. You've got a rubber band. If you've got a zip tie, rubber band, anything along these lines will work just fine. But you're going to take those, get them to where they can be bunched together, and you're going to hang them 
from a dark area. That works great with cuttings like rosemary, thyme, oregano, all of those sorts of things. You can pretty much dry a lot of uh, your vegetables as well as fruits. Uh, so we've got some pineapple here today. This is already cut uh, into one inch chunks. Uh, so basically you want to make those in cubes so you have great pineapple slices. We're going to throw those on the dehydrator in just a second. And we've got some peppers and tomatoes. So uh, I've got some asparagus here. One thing you may not know about asparagus, when you're dealing with asparagus, you want to get it and you want to just bend it to snap. And when it snaps, that is basically where your fresh asparagus is. So the bottom ends, you can just toss those and then basically line up your asparagus and just get them together. One good bend, whenever that snaps out, you've got your asparagus ready to go. So with this, I'm gonna set this up for traditional oven drying. Uh, you got parchment paper, we've got the oven itself set to 140 degrees. It's just gonna be on a warm setting. That's gonna be it, and we're gonna rotate it back and forth constantly. With aroma tomatoes, we're gonna slice these up really thin. They're gonna go on the dehydrator. When you're dealing with this, you wanna make sure that you're getting consistent, super thin slices. That way, the airflow can go through and it doesn't take a lot of time to go through that. Uh, when you're dealing with this, you basically wanna just take the lid off of here. Dehydrator is gonna be about 140 degrees and you're just gonna lay these on this. Now, when you dehydrators, <clears throat> some of them have thermostats, some of them do not. Thermostat is definitely the preferred method that you wanna have. You wanna keep it around 140 degrees but you throw your tomatoes on there, set that, let it run. If you don't have the thermostat, follow the manufacturer's instruction for air drying, 140 degrees. Don't always trust your oven thermometer. Use a side thermometer to help you out with anything that you need and keep an accurate temperature, but rotate the trays as we said before. If you wanna learn more about this, go to bonnieplants.com and find ways that you can dry and preserve your harvest. From gardening information to recipes, bonnieplants.com is available 24-7. If there's an issue with your garden that you need help with, ask Sydney by emailing him at simplysouthern at alifarm.com. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Simply Southern. We appreciate you being with us today. Next week, we'll meet a craftsman who makes pens that tell a story even before he puts ink in them. And we'll take you to Frontier Days to experience what life in Alabama was like more than 200 years ago. I'm Mary Johns. And I'm Jim Allen. We'll see you next week. Simply Southern is a production of the Alabama Farmers Cooperative and the Alabama Farmers Federation.